Hello, podcast listener. This episode of JJ Meets World features a special guest by the name of Evan Christie. You are not going to believe what he uses for a cell phone, what cut of steak he likes. Heck, you're going to even get some information about what it's like to manage a liquor store. All of that and so much more on this episode of JJ Meets World. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. This episode of JJ Meets World is brought to you by Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty. Natalie has a proven track record to get your home sold faster and for more money. She is consistently focused on her clients' needs and wants throughout the entire process and make sure that they are well taken care of. If you're looking to buy or sell, reach out to Natalie today. On average, Natalie sells a home every 3.74 days. That's at least two a week. And last year, Natalie earned her clients on average over $4,000 above list price on their homes. And you don't have to take our word for it. Here's some of the great reviews Natalie has received. I was overwhelmingly impressed with Natalie and all the Hatch team. She was very responsive and responded to all of the emails within an hour. She gave great advice and encouragement from the listing and pictures, the offer and all the closing details. The marketing team knew exactly how to promote my property and I was pleased by how soon and easily my property received an offer. I was actually dreading selling my condo and Natalie did such an awesome job that I felt like I really didn't need to do anything. The thing I most appreciated was that she really listened to what I wanted to do and respected my my decisions. I would definitely recommend Natalie and all the Hatch Realty team. They made this process so wonderful. That was from Diane. So listen, if you're in the mood to buy or sell a home, give Natalie a call right now. You can reach her at 701-388-9338. Natalie, N-A-T-A-L-I-E at HatchRealtyFM.com. Or you can go to LiveFargoMoorhead.com. That's Live. FargoMoorhead.com and find out some information. Huge thanks to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty for sponsoring JJ Meets World. One, two, three, four. JJ Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always snipping out his next adventure. Yes, he is. He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. JJ has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called JJ Meets World. I have one closet in my house that has a pull like chain to turn on a light in there. There's no switch for it. And it's my least favorite closet in my house of all the spaces because I don't like having to get in there and fumble around in the dark until I feel the chain and then pull the chain. And I always wonder, am I going to pull it too lightly? Am I going to be too strong and rip this chain right out of the wall? I just, it, it's just my, it's my least favorite closet to use. It seems to cause you a lot of anxiety. It does a lot of anxiety all the time. Um, and speaking of anxiety, My biggest anxiety in my life, and I'm lucky for this because I know some other people, anxiety is crippling for them, but it's when my phone gets to the part where the battery's red and says like, "Uh oh, you're running out of battery. Mm -hmm. I instantly start to panic and think of like, oh my God, I've made the worst life choices today. (laughs) Why didn't I, why didn't I get up in the middle of the night and plug this phone in? Or why didn't I put it on my charger pad earlier today? And I... I despise that feeling. And I've got maybe five or six of those block chargers, those like portable block chargers along with me. But those are never charged up either. So it gets me to go even further back in my life about the bad choices I've made. When the simple fact of the matter is, if my phone goes dead, it goes dead. Mm -hmm. People still will be able to find me. You know, I'm not out in the wilderness. It's going to be fine. Interestingly enough, we have a guest today who doesn't worry about that problem as much as I do because he if uses at all. Yeah, he uses a special style of phone. We're going to talk about it right at the beginning of this episode. Evan is an interesting dude. Uh, in this episode, Tucker and Evan gang up on me, and I think you're going to... We, we do not gang up on you. you. I feel real ganged you, up on... You get really upset that we both... That he, I don't agree. Do it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that you, both, you both agree on something, and I think a lot of people are going to, no matter how you consume this podcast, go, what? Yeah. What? I'm okay with that. I'm at peace. Um, <laughs> in fact, if you would, listener, please think of the sound of a record scratch 
<laughs> when this conversation takes place. And then you're going to have to keep going rah, 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 because they keep going deeper and deeper <laughs> into this well. And I expect them to come out wearing clown makeup afterwards and be like, <laughs> I have to, I have to admit, I was pleasantly surprised to hear Evan agree with me. Cause whenever I say my view on that topic, I, it's instant disagree. 90% of the people I talk to about mm-hmm. it. So it felt good to have an ally on that topic. Um, I met Evan recently as we started rehearsals for Hamlet, but uh, I've, we've both seen Evan around town for years because he's been enmeshed in the theater community in the Fargo Mohart area. And uh, just getting to know Evan through rehearsals, he's an interesting guy. He has some deep wells of knowledge on a few topics. So we get to those today. Yeah, I, this, is a, this is a fun episode just to kind of go along. Also, full disclosure, I'm very hungry at the time of this recording. So you're going to hear a lot of talk about food right at the beginning. <laughs> Right at the beginning. And it's a through line that we carry, well, that I carry until the very end of this episode. So, folks, I want you to sit back and relax and enjoy this episode of JJ Meets World with our special guest, Evan Christie. JJ Meets World. So, you got a a flip phone. Yep. Like, what kind of flip phone? Uh, it, so, it's I think it's an LG, but it's with track phone. So, I also do the pay-as-you-go Really? Yeah. I Why think, are you off the grid? <laughs> um, I just don't want to get sucked into my phone. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. So, uh, is so there's no e- email capabilities on this. It's got no it, email t- capabilities. T nine text or do you have Indeed, a QWERTY? T nine text. Yeah. So do you text? I do, but only short messages, and I, I tell everyone not to make me do a novel on it because mm. that will not go well. <laughs> you know, I. I bucked against the texting trend for a long time because I could, I just, I just didn't like it. It's like, mm-hmm. well, call me. If you need to tell me something, call me. And so eventually when the QWERTY keyboard came out, I gave in, but you're still holding strong. Huh? I really am. Yeah. I, I feel like if I need to do long form, I can do email, which is, you know, wonderfully slow and it's odd to say emails old fashioned, but it right. is now an electronic um, letter. But you know, that lets you really think about it and compose it fully at a full keyboard and then for texts for me are just for short things like, hey, I'm outside. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that works great. But then I don't, I can't, if I'm, if I'm out somewhere, I can't check my email, which is great. I, I don't have to be distracted by that if it's my day off and I'm not thinking about work. Unplugging is the biggest problem we have with our 21st century workforce because I think they're expected to be contactable 24-7. Yep. But it's only because no one has you know, said no and started a revolution. That's right? why a lot of companies give you a smartphone. Right. Because like, they want you to be, they want you to know you're contactable. Yeah. We want to reach you at any time. Yeah. And so exactly. the fact that we're paying for it means you have to answer. So did Tucker actually have to call you then to arrange this interview? No, he, he, uh, uh Facebook messaged me. I do, I do have Facebook. So. That, that actually is the primary way that we reach out to guests at the moment because Facebook Messenger, Facebook Messenger because it, it still seems to be. It seems to be the most universal platform right now that most people are on. I just was working with some teens recently, and they told me that they don't use Facebook Messenger anymore. They use Snapchat. Like we don't. We Messenger. haven't had any teens on this show yet. I know. I'm just saying. I've been working with some teens, <laughs> and they're not at risk either. They just. <laughs> um, how long's the battery life on your flip phone? Long. I don't have to plug it in sometimes for a whole week. Shut the front door. No, that's absolutely true. I'll be like, oh, look, I'm down to just one thing on the battery life thing. I might get another day out of it. Might have to plug it in tonight for, you know, a couple hours and it'll be fine. Does that just like annoy the hell out of your wife? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Everyone else in my life who has smartphones is so annoyed by that. <laughs> my battery life is perfect. How are you buying movie tickets? <laughs> I mean, or, or literally anything else that we rely on apps for. Like, are you having to actually log on to a website to pay your the bill? Yeah, that's that's what I do. Really? <laughs> Sit in front of my computer, go to the websites, and pay my bills that way. Oh, man. You know, I mean, I'm, okay, so let's, let's si- see both sides of the scale here, right? So I'm walking around with the wealth of human existence and knowledge in my pocket. <laughs> There is more technology in this than we had to get to the moon. So I can find out facts. I can learn things. I can communicate across oceans in an instant. But at the same time, this morning, it took me 30 minutes to get out of bed because I was checking 
like a news website and it was all the same stuff from last yesterday but i had to make sure it was all still the same stuff from yesterday you have to check right right <laughs> and uh i'm looking at this dude out here look at the hump on this uh, excuse that's me an, woman that's on that old, woman yeah, that's uh she's that's someone's grandma yeah, that, that, that she's, got that, she's got that like <laughs> she but look at how she's craning to be on her phone okay, the whole i don't time. know though if her phone is what's causing her, her, her the current shape of her back JJ. But, I, but i'm saying like <laughs> look at the hump on that woman's back and yes. now she's now she's aggravating it by having to bend over all the time even the way we set up our desks are not ergonomically correct you know the, the your um your uh, your screen is supposed to be at eye level where you're sitting, and most sure, of the time you're always it's lower, so you're always you know? crouching down a little bit. And so human beings are actually developing little tiny horns that are coming out the back of their head. Like that's kind of awesome. That yeah, is pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> dragon night. <laughs> are, are you guys kidding me? You're gonna have to throw away all of your winter hats, and you're gonna have to start fresh. <laughs> With horn hats. I just finished my last day working at a at a at a big corporate office, and all of the cubicles have standing desks where you can raise and lower. And then I've started to see some people even putting like little foot pedals in at their desks so that they can be like cycling while they're working. It just makes me think they look like gerbils. It's the same concept of mm-hmm. buying the phone. They'll they'll start attaching power generators to those, right? Then- or just have a big water drip right there that you can right. just suck on. <laughs> <laughs> how long some pellets how long have you had this flip phone I, seven years well wow. i have not had to buy a new phone in seven years i think it's only the third phone i've owned in my life i have thought at times about going back to a flip phone and just how it would drastically change my life now I, did you did you ever have a smartphone and you went back i to have a flip never phone? had a smartphone no i have i have stubbornly resisted it i'm i'm a pretty stubborn person and i can also be I can be cheap about the things that I don't, you know, that aren't things I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. So uh, that that's always been a big part of it. Why do I need to pay for that? I'll just keep adding 30 minutes at a time to my little flip phone and that'll be good. <laughs> so what, okay, so you're saving thousands of dollars, but where are you spending that money on? What's your, what's your vice? What's the Achilles heel? Um, I, I spend it on things I can consume. So food and drink, it okay. would be the area I spend my extra money. If you, do you, are you a vegetarian? No. Okay, good. So if you're going to get a cut of steak, what kind of cut of steak are you going to get? New York Strip. Nice. Okay. So Didn't even it, hesitate. That's, no, that's, that's my kind of guy right there. So I think that a lot of people think, well, the ribeye is the most flavorful. But really, if you love the taste of beef, a New York Strip is great, especially if it's got a really fine marbling in there. So mm-hmm. it can kind of still stay a little bit tender, but it's never going to mush off your fork. Like it, yeah. when you cut into a New York Strip... It doesn't depress itself into the plate like a ribeye would or a um, or a, or a piece of prime rib. Mm-hmm. It stays very firm like that, and I'll dig that. Yeah, the texture is good. It's got the right fat to meat ratio um, to make everything as flavorful as possible. Yeah, definitely. That's that's the cut I would advocate for. Nice. Are you yeah. putting like onions and mushrooms on top of it, or are you going straight beef? Oh, peppercorn sauce maybe. Peppercorn sauce is nice most of the time, though, if I'm doing a nice steak, it's just as simple as can be salt and pepper Um, because you really want if you're if you're spending money on it, you want to get the flavor of the beef itself. How do you cook yours in like what what what, uh, what's your temp? Oh, I go usually medium rare. Okay. Um, nice. We're best friends so far, Evan. <laughs> We're agreeing on all these uh-huh. things. Yeah. I'll pick up the movie tickets. <laughs> I got a phone that can do that. <laughs> um, it's it, the medium rare is nice because again, it doesn't obliterate the meat. Like you're talking about a tougher cut with yep. the with the New York strip. So going anywhere beyond medium you needn't have bothered right. just see mm-hmm. if they've got like a flank steak right on yeah. the menu. when i order a steak at a restaurant i usually choose medium just because i feel like i'm probably is they're not going to hit the mark i don't think they're going to go past it sure i think they're going to go slightly under it mm-hmm. to try to hit medium and that's that's my sort of my my the sweet spot for me but i i you, you want that steak blood yeah <laughs> yeah the hemoglobin the you want to taste that so good it's actually there's a specific name for that by the way okay and it's like myoglobin yeah Yeah, it's myoglobin myoglobin yeah it's it's not the blood it's a liquid that makes the muscles move i think that's what it is it's a a liquid that's in the muscle Mm -hmm. i just like to think of it as flavor 
It really <laughs> well, and it's great to dip like a piece of garlic toast in. You know oh yeah, about? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What are you getting for sides? Can you tell I haven't had breakfast yet today? <laughs> <laughs> You're a man focused on one thing. Um, ooh, I am. A, I mean, you know, garlic toast is a, is a must when that's available. Um, and can we all say that should be free? A good steakhouse should give you some bread. And is if it they none? come with garlic toast, it's even better. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Because sometimes they're like, we got, you know, you can, a side can be a piece of Texas toast. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, that's not a side. That is a complimentary item. Right. Right. <laughs> Um, I'm a big fan of asparagus with steak. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice, isn't it? it it's a good contrast. Um, you know, the, the meat and potatoes thing is classic, but they're both very heavy. It's nice to have something green on the plate when you've got this big chunk of meat mm-hmm. that's very heavy and, and powerful. It's nice to have something a little bit lighter. So I, I think asparagus is just about the perfect side. I prefer asparagus over green beans because it's more like fibrous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel like that matches the the meat I'm eating, right? So they're, Absolutely. they're two things that go well together. But also on the plate, it's going to soak up a lot of the flavor of the steak too as the mm-hmm. myoglobin goes around the plate. Mm-hmm. Those, the heads of the asparagus are just so good at soaking up that flavor and butter and, and anything else that the it was cooked with. Yeah, yeah, they're they're a great texture to to collect. And they also, if you cook them right, they just start to char. Yeah. So you get that little bit of caramelization. That's my on there. jam. Mm-hmm. And that's you know, that, that texture's perfect. You've got all those textures going on at once. I know a young man whose parents are both vegetarian. Now he's not vegetarian and it's not like they pushed it on him, mm-hmm. but because of that he had never eaten steak in his life. He'd never been at a restaurant and ordered steak because he's used to ordering things like pasta or he'll get, you know, barbecue chicken or something like sure. that. So we were out at uh, a local greasy spoon here in Fargo, the frying pan, mm-hmm. and he ordered steak tips. And he was like, oh, my God, these are amazing. They're so good. And I'm like, that is the shittiest piece of shit. <laughs> if you think that's good, you should see what I can do with a cast iron pan in an hour and a half. Like, I'll change your world. Um, recently... Burger King started their Impossible Whopper mm-hmm. promotion with their plant-based Whopper. Yep. Um, <coughs> now, first of all, I've done a little bit of research on it, and it doesn't seem to like it's not a d- huge, drastic difference in fat content and yep. uh, even protein to that to that matter. But my biggest problem is with the name. If something is impossible, it can't be like, like <laughs> yeah. well, guys, it's it, it's impossible to duplicate a Whopper. This should be called the absolutely possible Whopper. <laughs> like it is possible to make. It's, they just should call it the also delicious. Yeah, oh, that's a good name. Yeah, yeah. just call it the also yeah. delicious. Um, I saw that Kentucky Fried Chicken also followed suit and they made a plant based chicken. And to me, I'm fine with that because really all I want is like the skin. So if you can duplicate the taste of the skin. Yeah, the crunch is the important part. Right. We don't even really know it's chicken inside when it, <laughs> unless it's the leg. That's why I think that's where you have to get the bone in stuff at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Because if you get just the boneless, you're like, is this chicken though? Right. Like it's so flat. Oh, I, I prefer shaped. my chicken completely machine separated. I really, <laughs> really do. Yeah. I don't when we like we go to Applebee's all the time, JJ and I, mm-hmm. and I'm always getting boneless wings because I don't want to deal with that. I want it to not seem like it came from an animal i just wanted okay. to i want to feel like it just appeared into existence like that it never had fa- a face it never had a face never had a family never had hopes and dreams you're it's far just far removed from the ju- farm yes it's just <laughs> it's just delicious so you would hate have you ever had a cornish game hen i have mm, yeah oh. didn't like it those are fantastic <laughs> they're worth the effort oh totally yeah that, that, that's a great my family did that for thanksgiving one year and that's just wonderful because everyone gets their own tiny individual bird that you just mm-hmm. get to doesn't it kind of it's it's primal it makes you feel like a caveman yeah <laughs> like you're just ripping it's, this apart when i go to a fair the first place i look for food is i want that giant turkey leg sure because then i feel like i'm a king in medieval <laughs> england and i'm like ha, 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 ha. although like it's in one of my big dreams has always been to eat a rib off of a dinosaur like fred flintstone <laughs> I would like that to be my reality at some point. That's why I care about, you know, Jurassic parking some dinosaurs back into existence because I want to eat it. And be honest, you already have a notion of which ones would be tastier than which other ones. Like, oh, without a Brontosaurus doubt. would be so good. Oh, yeah. Brontosaurus, a patasaurus, I know, is more of the correct, right, yeah, the, the the correct term, but, but emotionally, we're still attached to Brontosaurus. Yeah. Gallimimus 
Probably not. They're no. running around quite a lot. I mean, that's the same thing where you, you got to look for the non-locomotive mm. muscles right. if you're going to eat something like a dinosaur because it's going to be gamey. Sure. No matter what. Especially if you could find like a kind of dinosaur that's on an isolated island with no apex predators on it. Yeah. So it can just sort of like lay around and like not have to be stressed too much because mm-hmm. we know what stress does to the meat. If you could eat a fictional food that you've seen in movies or television or books, or oh, video games, boy, what would that it be? Is, uh, fictional food. Because like I was watching that scene where uh, Chewbacca was going to eat a porg. <laughs> And from you're Last like, that Jedi, looks good. And I'm like, dang, porgs, I bet are delicious <laughs> with those squat little bell shaped bodies of theirs. <laughs> I think rather than a fictional food, I'm going to answer with the uh, there's a food that you, you, you can eat because it's an endangered species, but it's supposed to be incredibly delicious, which is giant tortoise. Really? Oh, really? It's one of the reasons they're endangered is when sailors first went to the Galapagos and started finding giant tortoise, they it took like a hundred years to get a specimen back to England because they kept eating them all. So they had like a big cage and like they, there's a day where there's no wind and they're like, captain, could we maybe eat a tortoise? <laughs> Raise morale a bit. <laughs> He's like, just one. And then that just leads to the rest. It's like yeah. when I open a thing of orange Danish rolls, I'm <laughs> eating them all. Going to the bottom of the bag of tortoises. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But apparently they, they taste just like incredibly tender, kind of like meat mixed with butter is like the description. What? They're just oh. apparently absolutely fantastic. Huh. Uh, Darwin wrote about it because he he ate tons of different animals. That was that was part of his <laughs> survival of the fittest. Darwin's latest cookbook. <laughs> I like, the, available I like, I like the notion that maybe he was just really hungry. And that's why all this research was happening. <laughs> yeah. Mm, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, this 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 finch tastes different than last year. It has evolved. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, Charles, we can't. Uh, we can't name your boat the buffet, <laughs> but we've already put a bee on there. And he goes, Beagle it is. My favorite of the dark yes, meats. Beagle, the most delicious <laughs> of the dogs. <laughs> uh, Tucker, how about you? If you're going to eat a, a fictional piece of meat. When you asked that question, I went straight back to the movie Hook when they're using their imagination mm. and then suddenly the table is full and it, they had all these bowls of, I'm guessing of like custard or cream or something. Mm-hmm. Vibrant colors. Vibrant colors. Bang around. It just looks so delicious to me. Other than that, I, I can't think of, a, like Evan said, a food that is merely fictional, but food in fiction, whenever you see a cartoon character eating a drumstick and it's just, it comes off the bone perfectly and it's a clean bone and it was nothing but machine separated processed yeah. meat in like a sphere on top of it. <laughs> I always wanted chicken to be, or turkey or whatever to be just like come that. off the bone like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've always wanted to eat a crusty burger because you can wipe it against paper and it'll make the paper clear because it's so greasy. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, I've always wanted to try Slurm from Futurama, which is the drink that they have. That turns out it comes out like from the butt of an alien (laughs) uh, when they go on that big tour. Um, I guess most of my stuff is animated. No, I guess that's not true. There's a couple things from Star Trek that have always looked interesting, like that they make in the replicator. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Hmm. why not? So I like like to think about the things I'm going to eat. Think about fictional. Yeah. Fictional foods. I would like to open a restaurant where you can get stuff you can't get anywhere else. So maybe I get a hold of one of these tortoises, right? <laughs> and then it's like, who's gonna who's gonna be wealthy enough to come and, and be able to enjoy this? Because I know it's illegal. Governor I'm doing Bergham. This. It's illegal. <laughs> Governor <laughs> Dougie Fresh. Come on, Dougie Fresh. I don't even know if he's if he could do it. We're talking about like somebody who's got pull. He wouldn't do it publicly, me. but you gotta believe someone with that dude's power is gonna be in some skull and crossbones society where they just do Machiavellian things and they <laughs> they, they wear they hunt man. They wear like Renaissance outfits and then they eat just the absolute most endangered creatures on planet, maybe even man. Yeah. You never know. Would just, you eat a human? Would you? No. If someone said, like, listen, um, so and so died, and part of their will was nope. they want to be put into fried chicken. They're going to be skins. disappointed in death mm. because I, I, I'd try it. Yeah. <laughs> me too. Yeah, I would. Absolutely. I'm just a little interested, right? Yeah, oh, of course. You've got to be di- curious. What's the difference between me eating a human and me eating chicken? I'm not saying there's any difference. I'm just saying I know what my psychological preference would be, and I would stick yeah. with that to, yeah. to stay away from being. 
uh, just uh, traumatized. <laughs> I think although you're in a minority in this group, you're probably in a majority in humanity. I so that's, guarantee you, know, you that I am. <laughs> that, 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 that's good for you. I'm, I'm more curious, certainly. You know, it, it has to be like ethically sourced. And that's the real trick with humans uh-huh. right. is that is that ethical sourcing. <laughs> the other thing is you'd probably want them to be a vegan because mm-hmm. meat from carnivores apparently just doesn't taste good. Oh, like that, that that's uh, you. Most of the good meat that we eat is from animals that are themselves herbivores. Mm-hmm. Um, it just the, the extra processing that, that people I've, I've read accounts of people who've had meat from carnivores and generally it's not as tasty. Really? So like if you eat like lion meat, it's not yeah. as tasty as you mm-hmm. think. Really tough and gamey, apparently. Mm. Interesting. I had black bear once. And How was that? It was all right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't amazing. It was all right. Part of the problem was it, it, very tough, very tough meat. Yeah. And so it's something that we probably should have slow cooked for like a day. Right. But we cut it into steaks and we did a slow roast on the grill. And so it was all right. It was tough. It It's hard to identify what the flavor is is but it it, gamey you know when someone says something's gamey yep it that is the exact definition on my palate of Mm -hmm. what gamey is so yeah this is what that's what it is what is i always i feel like gamey should mean it was fun to to hunt (laughs) it was really gamey it was fun it was fun it was a good game jumping all over the place built a rudimentary shelter let's eat it now um Evan, are you originally from this area? I am uh, from Moorhead originally, yep. Mm, yeah, to go to Moorhead High? I did. Go Spuds. Sure. Yep, yep. <laughs> Sounds like a, he's got a lot of school loyalty. Um, no, I liked my school. I just I, I always associate mascots with sports teams, oh. which I never really yeah. participated in or was, was interested in. Not to talk it down, it was just not my area of interest so i think my big problem with local like in the fargo moorhead area this won't mean much to people outside of here we really miss the i guess you know the point of mascots a lot so moorhead spuds makes sense because it's an agriculture product sure and there probably was a potato farm where your high school was at one point and there you go so that's why we're the spuds yep on our side of the river on the Fargo side, Tucker was a Spartan. That has absolutely no no connection thing to do with Fargo. I'm a Bruin, a bear. Uh, last time I checked, bears aren't very prolific <laughs> in the plains of North Dakota. Yeah, no, yeah. Maybe if I was like northern Minnesota, that makes sense. Or anywhere in Canada, Montana, mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. But there's probably someone in Montana who's like the wheat. Be like, we can't grow wheat here. We should have had a change. <laughs> and then what's um, the West Fargo Packers? But that's kind of a weird thing because it meant it was meant for the meat because they had a meat packing meat industry packing there. Area and they there, chose yeah. what, like a like a bull or something? Yeah, I some think? sort of like a bull or bronco. So essentially something that was being led to the slaughter. Right. Mm. That's yeah. what you're going for <laughs> yeah. high school is you're being led for the slaughter. <laughs> yep. It's just because a meat packing plant employee doesn't, you know, that, that would be a weird mascot right. with like that, that thing they use to stun <laughs> cattle. That's like he's just running around the stadium with that. Uh, <laughs> it's a good thing that at one point Fargo wasn't like the water purification city <laughs> of, <laughs> of the upper Midwest. We could have been the toilets and the plungers. Right. It's, just, it's just a just a construction cone. <laughs> we're the we're the under construction cones. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had a desire to move outside of the area? Oh, you know, it's a question I wonder with guests, yeah. but I hardly ever ask. A desire, yes, but things have always just tied me to the area. Uh, after high school, I went to MSUM. Um, because you really love them, that uh, the more east side, side of oh, the yeah. river. <laughs> yeah, got to gotta stay in the civilized state. <laughs> um. <laughs> Natch. Uh, no, but it was it, it's a good option because it's not an expensive school. Uh, and I was at the time looking at teaching, which is one of its specialties. Uh, so I did go for that. And then... At the last year that I was in college, I met my now wife and it just kind of made sense for us to stay in the area. So, yeah, I've thought about it. You know, I think everyone in, in this area thinks about moving to like Minneapolis. Certainly, I have a lot of friends down in that area. So have you ever noticed how it's the rural kids want to move to Fargo Moorhead to go to college? The yep. Fargo Moorhead kids want to move to the cities. The kids in the cities want to move to the coasts. Yeah, no, that's exactly the progression. Really, you just want to get away from your parents most of the time. You do. Mm-hmm. And what what amazes me is in a city like Fargo, 
you could live here and not see your parents for six months mm-hmm. as long as you don't go to the same grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one caveat. Uh, and then it's easy to avoid your parents, especially like I've lived on the north side of Fargo once when Tucker and I lived together in a house mm-hmm. with his dad and then briefly with his sister. Um, so I was an honorary Lucas for, <laughs> for a little bit. But living on the north side of town felt like I was living in a new city mm, because yeah. I was going to a new Hornbachers and I was going to the one restaurant that was on the north side <laughs> at the time, but I had to find new roads to get to places and they sure. had the El Zagel shrine up there. Mm-hmm. It feels different. Well, and you just had a move recently. Yep, so I'm in you- West Fargo now and it's, it's a, it's a part of town that's being newly developed too. So it, it looks completely different to me now. And in a year it's going to look completely different in another year. It's going to probably look completely different. Isn't too. that amazing? Yeah. We're evolving. Right. I'm going to CashWise now regularly. So I'm having to bag my own groceries. That's how they keep the prices down. I know. My bank making you bag your own groceries. Are you using reusable bags? No. You should get on that. No, I'm not going to. It's really good for the planet. To do Don't that. care. Convenience. Mm. I'm 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 with Chucker here. Convenience. <laughs> you can really on the bags? Well, the, the thing bags is, are so like, easy. You know, people are like ban plastic straws. Ban plastic bags, but it it, it accounts for like 0.02% of all the plastic waste in the world. Most of it comes from industrial sources. So it's just, you know, shaming people uh, for liking these little conveniences and changing these things that's massively inconvenient for large groups of people and then really doesn't make that much of an impact. And the things those, those like bans really hurt, you look at plastic straws, the, the big thing has been people with disabilities who actually need those and none of the alternatives work. And then I, I think plastic bags, I, the number of uh, lower income people who use and reuse plastic bags as garbage bags. That's what I do. And for, for various, it, it's a great way to save money. And especially if you're on that lower income scale, it, it can be an important, like, you know, it, it sounds weird to say, oh boy, not buying trash bags, how right. much of it, but it is a difference. And I think, I think there's a, a classist kind of thing going on with people who don't think about that well and the bags are already made so yeah. i'm merely intercepting them on their way to the environment like these ones are already made on a level that me not using them now will have zero impact now let me <clears throat> argue that they no longer are making outdoor toilets because there's not a demand for outdoor toilets. Because a so far superior if, product was made. Right, Precisely, exactly. Yeah. A reusable bag. That doesn't. That's a, not. A that's reusable not superior. bag. That's not superior. It's yeah. so superior. No, it's not. You can, make, you can do so many things with it. <laughs> if you can make plastic bags out of a plastic that biodegrades quickly, they're usable, you know, for the term of their life, and then they have a bacteria that like activates and degrades them. That's an improved product. Mm-hmm, you, I agree. You need, you need the technology though to innovate. You can't just ask people to do something more inconvenient. First of all, the majority of people aren't going to do it, and 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 second of all, it's just it's not going to solve the issue overall. I can't believe what I'm <laughs> hearing here. The reusable bag is such a great way to approach it. Not, okay, okay. So let's talk about this. It is a superior product because you can carry more in one of those reusable bags. Even the cheapest reusable bag that I got from like a bank can carry twice the weight a plastic bag can. But you don't really ever twice. need it to. I do, all the time I do. I don't. I buy fruits and vegetables. I'm not only buying things like Twinkies. So I've got <laughs> stuff that's got a heft to that. I do that too, but with plastic bags and no issues. Yeah. I can get... I just... I, this is ridiculous. I also think... How about this? So... Plastic <laughs> straws are not a convenience. They're a necessity for some. Mm-hmm. I agree with that statement. But if they put a glass in front of you that did not have a straw and it had soda in it, would you be like, I can't? Oh, no, I have no this. problem with that. I, it, but for people who need them, I think it's an important right. thing to have. So you just you ask for it. So rather right, than yeah. just, you know, rather rather than have it be something that a waitress throws under your table. Sure. That's it different can be than something a ban. can be requested. That's different than a I ban, never though. said ban. Right. But we're, what we're saying is he's talking about the actual ban. Right. And right. That, that does happen in a lot of places, and there's people advocating for it. So. Right. Although it is fun when you get the plastic straw in the paper to shoot it at whoever you're sitting with. The, the, that never works for me, so that's why <laughs> I hate it. Have you ever been able to make that work? No, it's awful. I'm so fumbly with my fingers. There's, a, there's an inherent problem, though, with ever trying to get me to even 
care that much about these topics because I foresee an AI winter coming within our lifetime anyways. So I'm such a night, I'm just such a pessimist about right. what the future holds regardless that I'm kind of like, yeah, fuck it. I'm going to use this paper knife once and I'm going to use it for peanut butter. I'm going to throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, when I am living on Earth 2, <laughs> I will let you know. I will be on one of the levels of virtual reality. That's where you'll find me. <laughs> I, oh really? I, yeah, I kind be. of get the pessimism though. Like th- there is part of me that's also like, you know, I like to I like to finish things. I like to see how they end. Right. And so I kind of want to see how Earth ends too. Sure. And I have a feeling it's coming. So yeah. this is just come on, hurry it up a little. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Interesting. I don't want that to happen. Like because I feel like <laughs> I have worked really hard to build a legacy that's going to go on for generations beyond me, like a John Wayne, if you will. And if, if the world's going to go blomp, I've done all that for nothing. I spent all of those sleepless nights planning my next move for absolutely nothing. See, here I thought you were going to go all altruistic with your response. It turns out it's just no, God, no, no. personal legacy. <laughs> yep, yep, without a doubt. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of legacies, uh, I was recently walking through the park and I saw like four new park benches. And they were all dedicated to people. And I thought to myself, well, are we not putting a bench up unless it's dedicated to somebody? Hmm. And if that's the case, why are we not allocating money to benches? Because I feel like benches are an important thing. Sure. And because of cell phones, in a way, I think, we don't want to sit on the same bench as another person because we've lost that kind of part of that human interaction. So even though I could sit on the same bench as Tucker... I probably, if I see Tucker on it, think, well, can't sit on that bench. Yeah, because like, how would Forrest Gump had its narrative structure if cell phones were a thing at the time? Because they would have just been on their phone no, the whole time. Not no one would to answer his story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. agree wholeheartedly. He'd be like, those look like some comfortable shoes. And she'd be like, I know. And then she'd take a photo of them and post them <laughs> on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Or you would just be able to see, you know, when like they in the movies where they do the picture of what the text looks like, like the text <laughs> yeah. would be like, OMG, this House guy, this style. guy in a white suit is really freaking me out. <laughs> a stranger's trying to give me candy. <laughs> be texting their local police department yeah. with like, this is Stranger what they Danger. warned me about. <laughs> the, I also the want guy to know, lost his feather. <laughs> Part of the, okay, so let's get into Forrest Gump for just a second since you since it's been brought up, right? Approach what kind of a shitty public transit system exists in this town where he has to wait an hour and a half <laughs> to get on a bus? Well, but don't the people sitting next to him change? Yeah, so I feel like their bus is coming. So why is his bus not coming? That's the thing is, I wonder if he's just choosing to continue sitting on this bench. No, for he's a while. waiting. For he's it. just waiting for his because bus because he says like. You know, this, in fact, the little woman, like the old woman, when the bus comes, they're like, aren't you waiting for the 15? And she's like, there'll be another one in a little while. Because <laughs> she wants to hear the rest of his story. So maybe I thought maybe he's just super early for no, his bus. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Hmm. And even if he's super early, it's the middle of the day. People are shopping. Any good bus system. I mean, a half an hour at the very most is mm-hmm. how long you should wait for public transit. Mm-hmm. At the most. So give me some backstory, Robert Zemeckis. Was the bus driver on this one? Was he a drunk? Did the bus run out of gas? Did it have a problem? Is the universe trying to keep Forrest from getting to Jenny? Do we ever see him get on a bus? No, because uh, he explains that Jenny sent a letter to come visit. And she's like, well, that's just three blocks that way. That's right. And so even Jenny's instructions are bullshit. Because if she got him to that point... She think well, he can't possibly get three more blocks. <laughs> so that I've is, got a lot of problems. You have, with, you have some serious issues with the film. I understand. I understand. There are, uh, there's so many like when gaps and logic. Like when he runs across America, the thing that they don't talk about is he doesn't have a pack on him at all. He's not running with a backpack. So where is he sleeping every night? He's a millionaire. Mm -hmm. But then he gets that group of people who's coming with him. So are they having to camp outside of the Hilton that Forrest is in? And if you ran a Hilton and Forrest came in looking like he did with that long, scraggly hair and he's got, you know, mud all over him and shit like that, you're not going to let that guy check in, right? You're going to be like, you're going to be like, I don't think his credit card is real. (laughs) 
I, I don't think he's going to be responsible for incidentals. <laughs> So I never figured out how his face made that smiley face imprint on the guy's shirt. Yeah. Doesn't make that's that's doesn't make sense. Yeah. Have a nice day. Mm-hmm. Um, I also that was the first movie I remember seeing with my parents where I knew what Sally Field was doing to get him into regular school. <laughs> Just remember she banged the principal. Yep. yep. And I remember watching my parents being like, uh, <laughs> this is inappropriate. <laughs> um, especially when he mimicked the sound of it when he came down, like your mama sure wants to get you into school, and he's like, he 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 he. <laughs> and Forrest certainly isn't helping the case by making that noise, right? <laughs> so, I am pretty sure my mom never had to sleep with any of my principals. At least I hope not. I mostly had female principals until high school, so. Pretty sure. Been awkward. That's a good place to be. Yeah. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> it's good to look back on that and think yeah. about it. Um, I wonder why they haven't turned Forrest Gump into a stage play yet. Seems like it's just asking for oh, it. Oh, yeah. You'd imagine that's on it. Someone's working on it. Probably right. turning it into a musical. I, it's a bummer that we're taking all of these great movies and turning them into musicals. I think that there's probably some that have, like Footloose. They did a wonderful job. Mm-hmm. With Footloose transitioning it from a classic 80s film into a stage musical. But there's some stuff like the Rocky. Do we really need a musical Wait, based off a Rocky of Rocky musical? Yep. Yeah, it was Boy, on behind. Broadway. That's a terrible idea. Right? I, at some point, you would hope that they run out of broadway franchise movies that they could just turn into a Broadway show. Because the reason they're doing it is that marquee value. Yeah. People, oh, Rocky, I know what that they're is. Gonna, they're going to go to it because they recognize it because people are more likely to go to what they recognize. Yeah. Oop. Yeah, it's not a not a great trend. But. The, theater is not the easiest place to make your millions. No. You know? So I can understand it from one aspect. But at the same time, you kind of want new stuff to come out. I know that, you know, JJ, you're not on the Hamilton bandwagon, but at the very least it was an original piece Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. wasn't based off of some movie or TV show or, or whatever. I'm surprised there isn't a emojis, the musical yet. Yeah. And now there will be. Yeah. Yep. Just <laughs> shit. That's a great idea. We're going to have the shit be the conductor in the pit. Um, I, uh, when it, so I'm a big fan of musical theater. Mm-hmm. And there was a great little mini series documentary that PBS made a few years ago called Broadway. Uh, I think like the great white way. And it was like okay. a six yeah. part mini series. Yeah. And, uh, um, Julie Andrews narrated most of it. Yes. Remember I think this? I have seen this. I think I, I think I watched it when it came out. Yeah. Hal Prince who passed away recently at the time of this recording was talking about modern musicals mm-hmm. and they were talking about how wicked they spent $15 million to get <laughs> wicked up and running on Broadway. And Hal Prince is talking about, I produced the most successful Broadway show of all time, The Pajama Game. And when we opened that show, it cost $100,000 in like 1955. Even that is huge. Yep. And he said, that was the most money spent on a musical ever. And he goes, I'm not trying to seem pompous here. I am am one of the legends of this uh, this genre. I have no idea how I would launch a musical today. I have mm-hmm. no idea how you would get the millions of dollars it takes to get a show up and running. He goes, you look at things that take five years to get going. He goes, when Meredith Wilson wrote the music man, it was like six months later, it was <laughs> on Broadway, sure. right? Yeah. Like it's getting it written is the hardest part. Mm-hmm. And then after that, they do out of town previews and they go from there and then boom, you're up and running. Yeah. And then hopefully you've got a couple year run like Camelot. Mm-hmm. But it, it today it's just changed. That industry has changed so drastically. But musical theater to some extent is still like um, is is unlike films, which in the fact I can walk around today and make a movie with my camera. Mm-hmm. Yep. You probably can't, Evan. Correct. Um <laughs> <laughs> You could maybe take a low resolution, resolution, a couple of stills. Yeah, no, uh, my, my friends and I, you know, we made our own comedy TV show when I, we were back in like high school. But yeah, it's it, the, the production quality on it is horrendous. It mm. is it's two, three, four guys running around 
with a camera that you can buy at Walmart. What was the show called? It was called The Matt Cook Show. The Matt Cook Show? Yeah, Matt Cook was one of the guys. He was like the shyest guy in our group, so okay. of course we named it after him. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what kind of comedy skits do you do? Oh, it was just lots of random sketch style comedy. Yeah. yeah. You remember? I mean, remember any of them? Uh, Pitch me. Let's say I'm Lauren Michaels. <laughs> Oh, oh, that's like, terrifying. Good news, Evan. I would like to have you on my uh, Saturday Night Live program. Don't know if you've heard about it. We've been going for 44 seasons, 45th, kicking off here in a little bit. I, we did a lot of really quick little ones. Um, some of them were very, you know, just improv based. Like they turn, they, a lot of my friends were, they specialized in more physical stuff. Like they, they did a lot of skateboarding and biking and would film themselves crashing and make a funny thing. I was definitely more the words based stuff. Um, one that comes to my head is that we do little quick ones. And I, I did one where I said, do you ever feel like life is just passing you by? And then the board game life <laughs> runs in front of my head. And then like, you know, 10 minutes later in the episode, I say, do you ever feel like operation is just passing you by and operation <laughs> slides? That, that, that's a joke that I remember from it. Um, but we, we did it's it for a, a long time. It's a very laugh style. Like the Smothers Brothers would eat that up. <laughs> they would think that you would be like, get this kid a contract. Let's go. Do you do you remember uh, when you first got interested in th- in the theatrical arts? I it was I think it was third grade was when I first took some FMCT classes at the community theater. They did like a summer, you know, couple week long go do a show thing. Um, and my teacher in third grade had suggested that I might be good at theater, that I might be interested. So I went and did that. And then started doing shows with the community theater okay. um, for a couple of years. So since I was pretty young, th- there was probably a period from like high school th- through college where I was never not in a show for more than three months. Wow. Like that was the longest gap until I graduated college because wow. I, did, I did a lot of theater for quite a while. Do you have sort of a favorite kind of show or role to do? Like, like for me... Uh, Evan and I are currently in Hamlet right now and uh, in rehearsals over at theater B. And um, while I'm loving the show, my favorite kind of role to have is one where I've got three or four really good scenes in the show, mm-hmm. but the rest of it, I can just sit in the green room and like just hang out and not worry <laughs> yeah. too much. About Those are it. fun. Absolutely. I don't know. I've done, I've done lots of different stuff. I've definitely, I like musical theater, but I've stayed away from that recently. Um, just because I feel like adding can, the singing and dancing layer is so much more work. I'd rather I'd rather just do the the acting side. I love doing Shakespeare. Um, I've done more of that in the last couple of years. Um, whenever something pops up, that's something I'm always excited to work on because I love the language and the complexity of that. Yeah, I remember your audition and thinking, there's no way he's not getting in. Like, like <laughs> Thanks, y- yeah. You're, are you, what did you do a monologue from? Uh, I was from Macbeth. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, it just... It, you hear him talk right now and you can you can tell the training he's 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 had and the work he's gone through. Mm. I don't care for Shakespeare. <laughs> I, I just don't, don't. I like the puzzle. I like that it's not the language we use. I think I, I like that distance um, that takes some decoding. I my first experience with Shakespeare was seeing a touring Guthrie Midsummer Night's Dream that came to town when I was probably 12, somewhere around there. Uh, and I absolutely loved it. I, I just thought it was fantastic. And, and creating that new world and that, that different type of language, I, I just find so interesting. It makes me, it, Shakespeare, it's both very emotional and very intellectual at the same time. And I like that it, it stimulates those two different sides. I, first of all, I think Shakespeare also would have been on this, like, let's not use plastic bags thing. Uh, <laughs> he would have written sonnets Strict about it. environmentalist is what you're saying? <laughs> I've had a conversation about this before, but I think my dislike of Shakespeare comes from an educational setting, yeah. which is when you're listening to everyone read Hamlet and it's you're just going like, you read two stanzas and yep. then you read and you're moving along class. Twer what that was not twer for I, Ophelia... And it's like, it's awful. And then you go see a high school production of any Shakespeare show. And there's maybe two kids who have really done their homework into yep. like how the, the, you know, the importance of the words and where mm-hmm. a breath should be. And uh, the, I will. The text is difficult and opaque. And yeah, we teach it in, in entirely incorrectly right in our oh, school system yeah. and so to me i it's like i would never want i would never want to go 
to New York and pay to see a Shakespeare show because I've seen so much bad Shakespeare. And that's the problem, right? So mm-hmm. I should want to go see good Shakespeare. Shakespeare done well. Right. But I'm all, I've am I'm been burned so many times, I'm not going to put my hand in that fire anymore. That being said, I love uh, 10 Things I Hate About You. Mm-hmm. Right. Love that thing. Right. right. And that's an adaptation of Taming of the Shrew. That's right. part of the, I feel like the, the education of Shakespeare, at least to teenagers, should be much more about the time in history and the effect his work had. Mm-hmm. And talking about pointing out where in popular culture you see Shakespeare pop up, which is everywhere. everywhere. Absolutely yeah. everywhere. And Hamlet alone, there are... 20 or 30 lines in that show that are that have been famous and you would have known them ever since you started watching Sesame Street. Yep. Um, and there's so many of them. Mm-hmm. And so, and I also like to think about the watching Shakespeare in the time of Shakespeare, what that must have been like to be a groundling at the, at the globe. Mm-hmm. Because in that, at that time, everyone's life just sucked. Just was just abject misery everywhere you went. Right. Most people were poor. They had to fight for resources constantly. They had little to no entertainment beyond going to the theater or maybe listening to some live music somewhere. But it just, you know, there's no electricity. There's no movies to think about. Books can be hard to come by if you don't have wealth. So your entertainment for a lot of people was to see shows. And uh, and then even those shows, which would range in length from three to five hours, would have different sections for different members of the audience. Yeah. So certain humor um, and more direct speaking between characters is for the poor people on the floor. And then much well, more of the soliloquies where the, the prose comes in and there's much more highfalutin in speech is oftentimes aimed at the aristocracy or the people who are sitting in the booths. And it's just a really, really interesting it's, view. You have to look at the two levels. I think that's another thing you have to teach is that Shakespeare is dirty. Oh my God. You, Filthy. You, you have to, if, if you ever were reading Shakespeare and you go, is that a dick joke? Yes, it is a dick joke. If it even remotely looks like it might be an innuendo, it absolutely is. It is, it is raunchy. That's actually how they read Shakespeare to try and figure out what the accent would have been at the time okay. is they look for maximum possible concentration of dirty jokes. <laughs> they're, they're all over the place in all his shows. So it's, too bad we never made like a really good version of, uh, let's say, Othello. Like like George Carlin really could have like sunk his teeth into some of those like a nice little like cameo role where he's like cock this. <laughs> um, oh, I felt dirty saying that. <laughs> felt real dirty. He left at the crowing of the cock. Um, I, I I'm gonna see Hamlet because I like to support Tucker in mm-hmm. what he does. Um, He's doing me a favor. Well, he hasn't been in a freaking show for six years, so I was like six <laughs> blissful years of not having to support anything that or any of his achievements. Um, but I am excited to see it. I'm excited to see what you guys do with this production. And uh, Tucker, I know you're going to crush it. Evan, uh, we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> He's killing it so far. You know, uh, as long as you turn your flip phone off, don't keep it in your costume. Wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> I would love to see someone do a play. So I love plays about plays. Mm-hmm. So noises off. We've talked about that one before. Mm-hmm. I would love to see sort of a, a play about people putting on a piece of Shakespeare where anything that could go wrong can go wrong. What was the Scrooge Macbeth? Scrooge Macbeth. We, we did yes. a show. That's exactly yep. what that show mm-hmm. is. And so I guess I find that. To be like when you can make something, if you know you're going to a show where the unexpected is about to happen, but you still get something that shocks an audience and right. like surprises them, I think you've really done your job. Would you include in that the complete the 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 uh, oh, a bridge a bridge a bridge? Yeah, I've done a bridge. Works. A bridge is a I've great done show. that too. Yeah. yeah, I think to some to some extent. That's yeah. a fun fun show. Yeah. Yeah, who did you do that? Was it with Matt, and, Matt, and Adam and Brad? That was a good, yeah. And that was at FMCT. We well, it, we right? we staged it at FMCT. At FMCT, we had our own little troupe, which Burkholder named the Mostly Men troupe as a joke because we were half, we were almost mostly men, but I think we were like almost half men, half women. Mm-hmm. Um, called it the Mostly Men troupe, and then we did complete works. We first did it at NDSU one night, then we went to. Was it Lemoore for like a weekend? Yeah. Some oh, yeah, because they, they've got that big stage out there, yeah, right? Yeah, like, I think that's... That's where they have like good 
part of governor's school is out there maybe i i, I might be saying the wrong tech because it was a really tiny stage mm. it was some tiny hole in the wall stage in some tiny hole in the wall town and then we came and did two nights at fmct and we did an earlier show and a later show where we kept the fucks in. Oh, okay. And I had both of those, <laughs> and I hit them hard. Which of the uh, which of the guys did you play in that? The guy who plays all the female characters. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. So I can't remember how they're, they're named and divided. I don't out. remember how they're. That, that's the that's how you. There's the one who plays all the female characters. Yeah, that's who I was. I, I played the guy who plays Hamlet. Okay, in gotcha. that one. So yeah, the, so that it was through that show that Brad Delzer was my first stage kiss because of complete <laughs> works of William Shakespeare. Yeah. Interesting. I have not been given a stage kiss in any of my roles. Given? Yeah. Like I mean, it's a gift. It is a gift. It's it the is. least sexiest thing you can possibly do. <laughs> what? Yeah. No. It doesn't matter how attractive your your co, your co actor is, it, kissing on stage is just 100% awkward. Mm-hmm. Oh. And if you do comedy, it, I've had three stage kisses and two of them were with men. Right. Mm-hmm. Because you, and especially with bearded men, like yep. if you, I, I have a beard, which you obviously can't see, but there is the, the comedy in two very masculine bearded men kissing. Having a smooch. Were you yep. ever worried that your beards are going to become intertwined and you'd end up like pulling out some beard hair from him not, or not yourself? Not at the time, certainly. But now? But now I will. Now I'll be, now I'll be very concerned about the possibility I mean, of beard intermingling. Because there's a difference, <laughs> like, right? Like you've got a big bushy beard. You got a, like a George R. R. Martin beard going on sure, over there. Sure, yep. And if you kiss another guy with a George R. R. Martin beard, like you're yeah. going to mash those things together. They're just going to tie themselves in knots. I, yeah. think, I think the thing, though, is it's really because Evan has a long beard. If you think about how Velcro works, he needs to kiss a guy with like a really short, stubby beard because oh, that's go. what's going to be the thing that hooks on to that. Otherwise, it's like taking the softer part of two pieces of Velcro. They won't attach together. Mm. Right. So some guy who's like down to like a quarter of an inch, maybe. And then it could really the stubble. I have really to be catch afraid of. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe. It was, so what? A hook and loop. Yes, hook, hook and, and loop, loop fastener. Because yep. Velcro uh, <laughs> is a brand name. Yep, that's right. They they want you to call it hook and loop fastener, which yep. of course we'll all start doing immediately. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like, oh, I gotta blow my nose. Would you hand me a Kleenex? Yep. I'm never gonna yep. say, could you hand me a tissue? No, they lost that one. Yeah, it's Especially interesting though. Facial there's, tissue. There's different ones in different places. Uh, we say vacuum, but in England they say Hoover. Really? Oh, the Hoover Corporation the Hoover, got that, yeah, huh? it's, it, it, it became so ubiquitous there that they use that as a, um, oh, what is it? There's a there's a name for it. Don't remember it. There, there's a something, oh, NIM, oh, for sure. when, you, when it becomes genericized. Got it. Oh. Hmm. If I'm going to clean the panes of glass that look out onto the street, I'm going to use Windex, mm-hmm. not window cleaner. Right. Yeah. Right? Um, Band-Aid. Uh, what are the good ones? That oh, here's use? a fun one. Heroin. That's, it's not, that what? was a, that was a medical company. <gasps> I can't, it's one of the ones that still exists, like, you know, Bayer or Merck or one of those uh, big companies back in like the 1860s. Heroin is a brand name. No way. Do you, yeah. do you think it was named after like, like the heroines of novels? Mm-hmm. And they're like we're marketing this to women, and we want them to feel <laughs> we want to feel like they're the lead of their own story. Well, I mean, it was marketed as the non-addictive or alternative to morphine. Mm-hmm. How were people taking it at that point? Every way they could. Okay, I mean, that's you, a silly you, you, question. You have a period of um, of world history that's known as the Great Binge. It's sort of like the late eighteen hundreds to right up to about World War One, when you know there was heroin and cocaine and cannabis extract in all the medications, children's cough drops, just anything was, it it was everywhere. And they were, they were being used all the time. You know, Evan, as we've been doing rehearsals for Hamlet, a lot of times you've demonstrated a really deep historical knowledge about a lot of the topics that have come up in that. So was that tying into what you were originally planning on teaching? Yes. I, my, my degree is in social studies education. Okay. Gotcha. And what are you you doing right now? Uh, I am a manager of a liquor store. Got it. Yeah. Which is actually fantastic. It's a really, it's a fun place. It's very, it's very um, focused on craft and, and high quality, and we do a lot of tastings and events. So Feel free if you need to move to get the sun out of your face, too. I don't oh, know if that's getting in your yeah, eyes. It's real it bright. Be, it it was okay in my face moment. for a little bit, and then I kind of jimmied around. And jimmied over, yeah. Yeah. Um, so being that you work in a liquor store, do you ever worry about the liquor taking hold? You know, it is it is an interesting thing because there I is am the liquor. There is mm-hmm. alcoholism on uh, my mother's side of the family, but my approach to it is very much more like my father. So I, I don't worry about it too much because um, I think I have a pretty healthy relationship 
That's good. Yeah. I have a friend who works uh, in a liquor store in Fargo, and she says it can be one of the most heartbreaking oh, careers yeah. ever because you see the same people who are coming in every day with change, with stuff they've yep. kind of scrounged up to buy the cheapest bottle of booze possible, and then you throw away a box in the back alley and they're passed out by the dumpster. No, I mean, there's definitely, there is a sadness to it. Um, but I think it's interesting having uh, gone through it with uh, with my mother. Uh, there's nothing you can do, really. You, you're, you're just in a, you're not in a position, you know, you, you sometimes go, do I want to reach out? Do I want to help? But really, you're just kind of this neutral observer. It is sad, though. There are definitely people who you go, uh I wish you weren't in here every day buying what you're buying, but that's where you're at right now. And who and who am I to judge is, is a thing right. I always think about. You know, I, I try to be I treat everyone with respect, um, regardless of whether they're coming in to buy, you know, an expensive bottle of wine or whether they're coming in to buy a 50 milliliter bottle of the cheapest vodka we have. You know, my mom dealt with alcohol addiction, too. Mm -hmm. And it was it, I mean, through it started with postpartum depression with my sister and just, you know, went, it went off the rails Yep. to the point where like, I didn't speak to my mother for long periods mm -hmm. of time. And one thing I learned about addiction through that is, and, and you kind of hit the nail on the head, which is like, it is that individual who needs to make the choice that like, yep. Yeah. Now is the time because you could say, listen, I'm going to ban you. You can't come in this store. They're just going to go to another store. Exactly. Yeah. You're not, you're not going to solve anything. we the only time we'll stop someone is if a family member comes in and asks us not to sell to them. We will do that. But that's, that's, you know, about as far as you can go really. Yep. Yeah. And that, and even in that, that's someone who's close to them. Exactly. It's yeah. not the person that they casually see. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very difficult. It's very tough on the lighter side. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're really at an interesting time now for spirits, aren't we? Like there's a lot of craft spirits being made and Absolutely. they're really, um, the, 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 the alcohol industry is very similar to the candy bar industry where these companies are literally throwing pots of spaghetti at the wall, trying to see what's going to like mm -hmm. stick. So flavors have changed. I remember uh, when I was a kid thing, like, well, you go in and you buy vodka. Well, now how many flavors of vodka are there? There's like a million. They're figuring everything out. There's like cotton candy vodka now. It's interesting. Industry-wise, uh, the flavored vodka trend has fallen off a cliff. It peaked like maybe seven years ago when you had all the weirdest flavors of vodka you could possibly imagine. And they filled the shelves and then no one wanted to buy them again because they were novelty products. So like, you know, everyone turned 21 and went out and bought the silliest flavor they could find. Most of the flavored vodka we carry now is fruit flavored. You know, the simple, like, classic ones that you think of, citrus Made for fruits. a mix. Yeah, exactly. We, we don't, I don't have the, you know, cake and cotton candy in the store anymore because it, it, it slowed down to a crawl um, in terms of sales. So there, there was an interest, it, the, the ebb and flow of the trends are really interesting. Do you find people coming in and they're incredibly brand loyal? Like, is that something? Because I'm, I'm told that the, the, like, our parents' generation brand loyalty to their choice of booze is very important. So yep. they're not coming in and saying like, Oh, okay, well maybe I'll try this this week. They're always grabbing the same brand of brandy or the same brand of amaretto there. It's always the same 12 pack of beer. They've got their brand and that's what it is. But our generation really are do change things up a lot. Yeah. that That's uh, you know, it's a generalization, but it is very true. Not that there aren't people who defy that, but by and large, uh, older shoppers, they stick with what they know and, you know, they will leave the store if you don't have the particular brand of, you know, domestic lager they're looking for. Oh, you only have that in light? I was looking for this version of that particular beer. Um, but yeah, people who are younger are always, what do you have that's new? What's different? I haven't seen this before. Have you had it? It's a different mindset. And I, I find myself falling into that. I'm always interested in trying new stuff. What is, uh, what's the one piece of swag that you've gotten from one of these liquor companies? It's like, dang, man, this is the <laughs> best. You know, I think we're out of the era when, uh, you got great swag. Like the, the, <laughs> I, I, the best thing I ever got from someone is a really good corkscrew, like oh, a yeah? really solid one with a great hinge and a really nice serrated knife that cuts perfectly for the, the foil. Like that's probably the nicest thing I've, most of the time they have like t-shirts and, uh, 
you never get free t-shirts in double extra large. No. No one ever, ha- you, you know how that works, yeah. right? They're, they're all- like, do you know the market you're serving right now? <laughs> exactly. So, you know, they come by with a free t-shirt and it's an adult small. And I'm like, thanks. This is very useful for me. When do you think we're going to see, because, you know, corporate synergy is huge as well. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I like a rum, rum and Coke. It's not a big surprise to me that an advertising agency put those two things together. And then rum companies and Coca-Cola were like, yes, we're best friends. Because rum and Coke is going to be the drink that everyone wants to order because it's sure. a hot to trot thing. Do you think we're ever going to see like not McDonald's brand vodka, but like <laughs> like like McDonald's choice vodka? <laughs> McDonald's selects. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like for the pears, discerning cheeseburger eater. Pears great with a Big Mac. I think that you, you always see corporate tie-ins, it, it, but... What they do more is they take advantage of viral moments. So we actually just had a really strange product launch this week. And oddly enough to being here talking on a podcast, it was related to a podcast. Ooh, Uh, there's I'm I'm not familiar with it, but it's like barstool spitting chiclets. Have you guys ever heard of it? I heard barstool sports. I know what barstool sports is. I know what barstool sports is. Okay, so apparently there's a guy on that show who said one of his favorite things to drink is New Amsterdam vodka mixed with pink lemonade hmm. and new Amsterdam vodka contacted him and said, we will make that and sell it. And I guess his name is Whitney. So they've called it pink Whitney and it just released this week. And I ordered, I, I started getting calls about it last week. So I was like, all right, I have to order this in when it shows up. And the first second I got it, I'm like, get me a bunch of cases of that. And I did have to, when I first looked at it, I'm like, Oh my God, I have a stack of pink lemonade flavored <laughs> vodka. This is a mistake. <laughs> It's just going to be like three guys who want this. Uh, no, we sold out in three days. Whoa. Wow. And then it, it is kind of, <laughs> there's an interesting uh, like masculinity contrast going on when you look at all these, because it's all guys. I don't think I've sold a bottle to anyone who wasn't a, you know, guy wearing like a team sports t-shirt mm-hmm. and they're picking up four bottles of bright pink vodka. That's pink lemonade flavored. So I do, I do kind of love that like <laughs> bit of cognitive dissonance that's are there, going on. Are, are the reviews in like, are people liking this or yeah, is I've had, I had people who bought it the first day, come back and buy more. So I think people are liking it. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't be my thing. Mm-hmm. It'd be kind of toward the sweeter end. Right. Um, but I, I imagine for people who are, and a lot of people are looking for those sweeter, lighter things. So I think for them, it's, it's probably a really good product. I but. try to just avoid hard liquor in general, if I can. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and when I drink, which is very, very rare, it's almost always just beer. Um, because when I got out, of, I didn't drink ever until I got out of high school. I was just total straight edge in high school, got out of high school, broke up with girlfriend, get depressed, start drinking. Right. I was there <laughs> that JJ night. JJ was there that yeah. night. Um, and, uh, my, for the first year of me drinking, it was basically just blue UV vodka because it was flavored vodka. So yep. it didn't taste like vodka. It tasted like juice Mm -hmm. um and it got me drunk really fast but then with that and all the other hard liquor i was drinking i would be i would hard liquor would give me asthma attacks oh interesting or or it was like a cross between an asthma attack and an anxiety it was so weird Mm -hmm. and it burned and it hurt yeah and it i really didn't like it Mm -hmm. but i found that beer did not do that to me sure for whatever reason though it's just obviously it's a different spirit it's a a different way of drinking right yeah and so i stuck with beer and i also was able to just take the flavor of beer too Mm -hmm. i didn't need to mix it with anything my very first beer i first alcoholic drink i ever had i was 17 in ireland my mom took me there and she's like, we'll, we'll hook you up with at least a Guinness. Sure. And we found a, a, a bartender who was willing to, to be sympathetic. Cause even mm-hmm. though the drinking age is 18 there, it's a little looser. It's a little yeah. looser. And, um, when she, she put a pint of Guinness in front of me and was doing it in a sort of secretive way, right? Like, Hey, you know, don't let people see you drinking this. Yep. And so I took that to me and watched chug it. <laughs> so I chugged a large, just a pint of Guinness. Mm-hmm. And it was delicious. I loved it. But I mean, I didn't get to taste a whole ton of it because right, I chugged yeah. the thing. So yeah, dark beers especially, but beers in general are what I'll drink. Mm-hmm. I try to avoid liquor. Uh, tequila knocks me on my ass. However, other mezcals, mezcals that I've tried have not done that. Sure. Um, so I have a little bit of luck with the other agave plants. But mm-hmm. I do a little bit of everything. When I, I remember my first drink in a bar was when I went to Toronto to visit a friend of mine from high school. And I think it was 
2003, so I wasn't 21 yet, but legal drinking age in Canada, mm-hmm. 18, baby. <laughs> um, and was I it said, Boone's Farm. No, I was like, I want, I want to drink, but I like, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I know that I'm not gonna like the taste of booze. Like that's the thing, because I tried to sip a beer and I'm like, oh my god, this is gross. <laughs> And so she's like, get an amaretto sour. And so I drank amaretto sours all night at this awesome drag club we went to called Zelda's. And uh, over the years, I've really, really refined that where I can enjoy. I enjoy vodka if it's served right. I'm not going to take a swig out of the bottle because that is freaking gross. And I'm not 21 years old anymore. (laughs) But I love gin and tonic. I love yeah. Hendrix gin with a cucumber, not a lime. Sure. It's a refreshing drink to me. In the Very summertime, good. I like those for sure. Mm-hmm. Even in the winter, I like it. I should try in the winter. In the winter, you might switch over to like a Tangeray because it's got a more piney taste. So it tastes like Christmas. Uh-huh. <clears throat> it's an interesting association. Yeah, that it makes really sense. is. So yeah, what, yeah. The, what would be on your liquor shelf then, Evan? Of like the stuff that you're going, this is what I drink. Um, I have a pretty extensive bar cabinet because I started um, with mixing cocktails. I got fascinated by like classic mixology. And so I have a lot of different stuff. I really like bitter things. I have a palate that skews pretty bitter. So I have a wide selection of uh, Amari and Italian aperitif type liqueurs like Campari. Okay. Um, So I have have a lot of that. Mezcal is also a big fascination of mine. Um, That's my favorite sipping spirit, even more so than whiskey. Right. Um, it's an upper, right? Isn't it? It's got like kind of caffeine in it, or it's no? Similar? It's just a, it's just a spirit. It's just an agave spirit. Okay. Um, there's there's no real additives to it. I okay. just think the the flavors you can get. It's a, it, whiskey's great, but it's it's very much related to the oak it's aged in. You, you, there's this range of flavors that oak provides, and you get a little bit from different grain bills. Um, but really, it's in the end kind of an extraction of oak is what you're tasting, and those are fun, familiar flavors. But I really like the different flavors you get from agave and from the roasting process. It feels very connected to that plant. Over Christmas, I was visiting family in Kentucky, which is my dad's side of the family is from mm-hmm. there. Obviously, that's where the bourbon comes from, and uh, we took a tour of a, of a bourbon uh, distillery, yep. right? Bourbon distillery. And uh, the moment you got on the property, you could smell it. Oh, yeah. And it was so good. So you go through this whole tour and you see the big vats and the different processes they go through. And you look at all the the, the barrels that mm-hmm. they're, you know, they're aging in and they'll reuse them in some certain ways for some and others they'll split up. Um, and then we did a tasting at the very end of it. And they walked us through this whole process with like a piece of dark chocolate. Okay. Where yeah. you, would, you would put dark chocolate on your tongue. No, no I'm sorry. You would take a small sip, mm-hmm. and that was just to make your tongue go, okay, we're going to drink bourbon now. And then you'd put a piece of dark chocolate on your tongue, and you'd let it melt for a second or two. And then you'd take the next taste, and then you'd swish it around in your mouth. And uh, it was the first time I ever noticed flavor profiles and mm-hmm. the differences between things. And for a few seconds, it would taste one way, and then it would taste another way as it kept going. And I'd never experienced that before. That was really, really cool. Have, have you ever gone on tours like that? I've, I've not gone on a um, a specific distillery tour. I've toured a few breweries, um, but I'm familiar with, I've read a lot about the process. And I, I think tasting is, it's such a cool process. It's something I actually love doing and, and get to do with my job. Um, is tasting lots of different stuff. And, you know, yes, with the, with wine tasting, you do spit and, and with everything, right. it, it's, it's that process, but I love the way it engages you both, um, viscerally, it engages your senses, your taste, your smell, it, it engages uh, how it feels in your mouth and texture. And at the same time, you're going through your head and going through memories and what things remind you of and, and what this flavor is, what name would I pin to that flavor in particular? And how is that different than what I've tasted before? Uh, I, fi- I find it a really engaging process. We, you know, we we drink liquor, but smell the your sense of smell seems to be such a massive. Absolutely, part. smells most of it. You can only taste your basic, you know, salty, sweet, sour, bitter umami is basically what your tongue can do. Everything else, even when it's in your mouth, is being operated by your olfactory senses, by your nose. Oh, okay. Hmm. Do they make a liquor that tastes like orange Danish rolls? Like what? Orange Danish rolls. Pillsbury's <laughs> orange Danish rolls. I I wouldn't be surprised. You could probably mix a couple things to get there pretty easily. You know, I'm sick and tired of all these craft beer places. They're like, oh, we're just going to put a ton of this into the <laughs> batch. I'm like, no, no, just make a really good beer. You don't right. need to put 
70 pounds of gushers <laughs> in there like it's, it's not you're not experimenting we're not in the back <laughs> mixing shampoos and calling it potions okay <laughs> it's just not the way that it rolls there was days. a a barcade i went to in philadelphia about two years ago i'm blanking on the name of it well okay so interestingly enough i got a cease and desist from the company barcade saying that is a trademark brand like Band-Aid. You, you got one. I got one because I wrote a I wrote a blog about Fargo's latest barcade because I thought barcade was just the term they used. Oh, okay. Mm. And so apparently that is a. So did you go to a barcade brand barcade, I or don't, did you go to a bar that had an arcade I, in it? it? It was a bar full of arcades, mm-hmm. and I used the portmanteau. 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 Yeah. Barcade mm-hmm. uh, to describe this place, and if they would like to send me a cease and desist, uh, fucking bring that shit. It was just, it was so weird because I'm like, well, yeah, why would they care about your blog? Like, it's that's like, weird. What, yeah, well, I, I suppose know. it's because if you don't protect a term, you lose it. I guess so. That, that's what happened to like Kleenex is eventually you'll get a court decision saying, nope, it's in common use. So you have to keep sending out those letters to prove that you're trying to protect it. So that's probably mm-hmm. all every time they've, they've probably got a massive like search engine algorithm just going after any time it spots that word. But at the same time, then I wonder, I, I bet there would be little to no, nothing they could do besides no. send the letter. No, probably. They're like, probably not going to pursue it. Right. You know, but it's a. Uh, it's a way of showing that you're trying to protect interesting it. interesting well anyway so i went to this i switched it and then i wrote an article about how, or i wrote a blog about how i got this cease and desist and i'm like <laughs> hey you got so more I, content yeah yeah i was like so i guess this company's really worried about us using the word barcade <laughs> and then they sent another letter after that being like we weren't trying to be offensive we just are trying to protect our brand blah blah blah, blah. and i'm like tough i already put dragged you guys across the mud <laughs> yeah because, please please Send them a cease, or they should send you a cease and desist to not talk about the fact that they did. And then when you talk about that, that cease and desist, yep. they have to send another cease <laughs> and desist. That is the that freedom one. of speech <laughs> and the press. I'll even hide behind that one. Yeah, it, it. There's been all this buildup now. My story is really not going anywhere, <laughs> except that while I was at this barcade, TM reserved copyright. Don't use that word again. Um, they had all these craft beers there, and they had a dark Guinness style beer that also had peanut butter and coffee flavoring mm-hmm. mixed in somehow. It was so good. <laughs> so now I'm sort of chasing that dragon. Anytime I'm at a place here, that's got something remotely similar. Mm-hmm. I, I order it hoping that I'll get that feeling again, but I couldn't even tell you what, what the, yeah. what it was called. I'm going to have to look up all the barcades TM. Never use that again, Tucker. That's an evil thing to say. No, no, I'm saying you can use it all you want. I'm just asking if you were in an actual barcade. Brand I'm not saying barcade. that you're saying that I'm speaking for the company that's writing the cease oh, and yeah. assist right now. It's going to start with fuck you. <laughs> Don't say this name. How dare you, How sir? Dare you? I wish like it came from their, not even their corporate account. It came from their like rep- like That's so like funny. representation. And I wish that their rep- representation would have been like <laughs> the firm of Mario, Luigi, and Donkey Kong. Well, <laughs> well, one of my favorite examples of something like this was years ago. There was a guy who created a website called Crapped. And it was craft, but he just changed the F to a P. <laughs> and then he was selling merchandise <laughs> and all this other stuff. And craft, you know, cease and assist, but they went hard at him. Mm-hmm. And I think he won. Oh, wow. That, that it was a parody sure, of, yeah. of, of their brand, <laughs> of their craft. Yeah. Anyways. Craft dinner. Yeah. <laughs> It's like there, there's that um, Facebook f- page for Kurger Bing. Have you guys yeah, seen that uh-huh. one? No. Oh, it's it. Look it up. It's pretty fun. They just like change words in Burger King, but it's also really like nihilistic. It's pretty funny. <laughs> um, Evan, as we wrap this up today, it's mm-hmm. been a real pleasure to get to know you a little bit um, with your flip phone. So your wife has a smartphone. Yep. You have a flip phone. Correct. Has it caused any marital issues between the two of you? No, nothing specific. Um, she's she's pretty good about it. I mean, she keeps encouraging me to get a smartphone, but there hasn't been any. There's no specific issues. What if you opened up a birthday present from your wife and she's like, hey, <laughs> and she got you one of like the track phone, smartphone, ver- you know, one of those right, versions. Yeah. And she's like, happy birthday. Because now you're walking a fine line of being that guy who's like, this gift is bullshit. <laughs> I, I think my cheapness in that area would probably win out and I would start using it. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Is the thing. Yeah, if, some, if someone actually went through the process to give it to me for free, I'd be like, all right. 
<laughs> when you but there's read, a data plan though yeah, more than yeah, likely exactly yeah when you read a christmas carol are you like yeah it costs a lot of money to buy coal back in the <laughs> that era no i mean i'm not i'm not the, I'm like, you I don't, don't identify I, I just, with scrooge I, I just like i like i said I, I i will allocate more money toward food and beer and things i care about going to see theater and stuff like that but like i buy like really cheap shoes because i'm like yeah, okay i'll wear these for three months and i'll buy another pair of cheap shoes these are fine I do. These are very, these are like $10 shoes. Are those slip-ons? They are. Me too. Yeah. I slip on all the time. I think, do you remember when back in the day, like it was like, if you, there was an age where you couldn't have Velcro shoes anymore. Yeah. Like no more Velcro shoes. I see adults all over the place wearing Velcro shoes. Excuse me. Hoop, hook and loop shoes. With hook and loop fasteners. Yeah. (laughs) Velcro brand, hook and loop fasteners. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Evan, you have a good one, and uh, I'm never going to text you. I'll always call you on your flip phone. Sounds good. Thanks very much. A huge thanks to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty for sponsoring this podcast. Folks, if you're looking to buy or sell a home, contact Natalie Deutsch today because Natalie Deutsch is not only a previous podcast guest, she's somebody who's going to care enough to sell your property for top dollar. She's also going to find you the best price possible if you're purchasing a new home. Last year on average, Natalie earned her clients $4,000 over list price on their homes and sold them faster than the market average. On average, Natalie's selling a home every 3.74 days. That's two homes a week. Those numbers don't lie. Find out why Natalie is one of the top agents in this entire market. Get a hold of her today, Natalie at HatchRealtyFM.com. You can also call 701-388-9338 or go on to LiveFargoMoorhead.com. That's LiveFargoMoorhead.com. Read all of her amazing reviews and then listen to her episode of JJ Meets World. Thanks again to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty. That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode of JJ Meets World and would like to help us continue to produce two new episodes every week, you can donate to our Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash JJ Meets World and donate today. Even as little as a dollar a month can go a long way. Visit our website at www.jjmeetsworld.com or hit up our social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the sites the kids are using these days. If you'd like to stay up to date on new episodes of JJ Meets World, you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, or wherever you consume the podcast that you love. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by checking out www.moonbasemaria.com. If you want to get in touch with your host with the most, go to linebenders.com, and you can find direct contact info for JJ. Somebody is going to listen to this episode and is going to murder you, Tucker, with a plastic bag. Classic plastic bag over the head. And when the cops come and ask me about it, I'll be like, he chose his own fate. 